Let's look at the second part of this uh, lecture. We want to understand the concept of the sample complexity and model complexity, and we also want to understand the trade-off between the two. So what is sample complexity? Uh, sample complexity asks the question of what is the smallest number of samples that we need to learn well in this, uh, in this learning problem. That is, uh, is required to ensure that the training and testing error, they are close. Uh, and what do we mean by close? And close means that within certain epsilon, with certain confidence, one minus delta. And this is true regardless of what learning algorithm you use. Okay, so the sample complexity is capturing the number of training samples that you will need to achieve your epsilon and your delta, such that your, 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 your generalization, your testing error is close to your training error. That tells you the number of training samples you need for a particular hypothesis set for using a particular uh, learning algorithm under a particular distribution. So you want to understand what is the sample complexity under all these circumstances. The concept of model complexity is telling you what is the largest model that you can use. And here by largest, I mean that what is the, in terms of VC dimension, what is the largest VC dimension that you can achieve. So that refers to the hypothesis sets, and that refers to uh, this, this complexity has to be taken relative to the number of training samples. And so largest is measured in terms of the VC dimension, and we want to measure also using the concept of uh, epsilon and also one minus delta. So we want to quantify this notion of sample complexity and model complexity. We want to generalize these two ideas coming out from the generalization bound, and we want to see the, the interaction between these two qualities. So let's look at the sample complexity first. The generalization bound that we have discussed before is given by this equation. Let's look at the upper bound, because the upper bound tells you that the, the, the testing error cannot be worse than the upper bound that I'm showing you here. So this upper bound gives you a couple of information. First of all, the, 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 the testing error is no worse than the upper, uh, the, uh, is upper bound by the, by the training error plus this term here. And in this term, you have, you have n, which is the number of training samples. You also have mh of 2n, that is the growth function, which we can further upper bound using the sour lemma. That will give you a polynomial in terms of n, and also in terms of the vc dimension. We also have another term, which is the delta. The delta is the confidence that you will want to achieve in this equation. So if you make the delta extremely small, that means you want to be more, uh, more and more confidence, then, then you need to have a much, much bigger n in order to achieve the same, uh, uh, accuracy, where the accuracy is defined as the, 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 the square root of, of the terms. So if you want the generalization error to be at most epsilon, then what you really want is that you want this error, this e in plus the epsilon to be well controlled. In other words, you want, you want the square root term to be less than or equals to epsilon. Uh, so we can rearrange the equation from the second line here. So you can look at this. Let's remove the term, we, we can move the term around so that we can write in in terms of the epsilons. Okay, so now let's do some calculation, and you can easily show that as, as I want to write this equation in terms of n, n has to be bigger than or equals to the quantity that I'm showing you uh, on the right hand side, which is a divided by epsilon squared times the law of certain terms. Now, let's look at this equation here. This n, uh, it says that I have to be bigger than a over the epsilon squared. As your, as, as your uh, accuracy becomes uh, higher and higher, that means you want your epsilon to be smaller and smaller, then of course the n will grow. Okay, so as, as epsilon becomes smaller, you need to have a larger number of training samples in order to achieve the same level of confidence. Uh, same here, that if you want to have a del if small delta, 
The small delta says that I want to be really, really confident, and so we want to be very, very conservative. Again, you need to have a very, very big N. Now, what is the role of the VC dimension? The VC dimension is playing a role in terms of this, uh, uh the log. So it, as N grows, okay, as N grows, this VC dimension uh, we, we, uh, you can have a, you can have a higher VC dimension. Well, in other words, if your VC dimension grows, then that means your N should also become bigger. Okay, why is this the case? Well, you can think of you are taking the log on the, the the two to the power two N to the power D, and the D will of course come out uh, in front of the log when you take the log. Okay, and so as the as the DC dimension as the VC dimension grows. As the confidence becomes uh, more and more conservative, as the accuracy becomes more and more conservative, then the number of training samples that you require will also grow significantly. Uh, this is what we mean by sample complexity. It means that the number of training samples has to grow with respect to epsilon, delta, and also the d. Let me give you an example here. Suppose I have a VC dimension of 3, think about a, uh, a linear classifier in 2D space, uh, and then I have the epsilon of 0 0.1, this is your uh, accuracy level, and I also have a delta equal to 0.1, this is 90% confidence. Then we can calculate what is the number of training samples that we need. You can put into this equation, and you can calculate the n. n has to be bigger than or equals to a divided by 0.1 squared times the log of all these quantities. Now you say, wait a minute, you have n that is appearing on both sides of your equation. So how should we do that? Uh, that can be done using some engineering heuristic as follows. So how do we solve n? How do we solve for n in this equation? Well, you can, you can do it iteratively. So you can put n equals to a thousand onto the right hand side of this equation. Then you can put it in, then you can calculate this number. That will give you a number of approximately like 21,000 samples. Okay. So you say that, okay, if, if n is equal to a thousand, then my, my, my estimate of the training sample has to be 21,000. And so you can see that's a mismatch because the end that you put in on the right hand side is a thousand, but then the end that you put in on here is 21,000. So that's a mismatch. So let's try to do the one more iteration. So if you do that, you can put n equals to 21,000 into your equation again, and then you try to calculate the right hand side, and you try to iterate, and do it a few times, then you get n equals to 30,000, and then so you need, um, uh, and so, so now you need 30,000 samples. Now this 30,000 samples uh, coming out from your calculation is a little bit closer to the end that you're plugging in when you do the calculation. And you, so that, you, know, you say that, okay, uh, this 30,000 samples seems to be enough to, uh, to quantify this behavior. Okay, so, uh, uh, so now you can see that th this sample complexity is able to tell you some information about how many samples that you ever need. So suppose I give you a classifier, I tell you the, the complexity using the VC dimension, I also tell you the confidence, I tell you the accuracy level I want, then I ask you what is the number of training samples, according to all these equations you can return me an estimate using the iterative uh, procedure. Uh, the problem of this estimate is that, uh, as we discussed before, the generalization bound here is not necessarily very, very tight. In other words, what you are calculating here, the 30,000 samples, usually it would be an overestimate. You, are, you, are t you tend to be more conservative than needed. So that means the 30,000 sample, 30, samples, would it be enough? Usually it's more than enough than you actually need. Typically you need a significantly less number of samples. But does it mean that the, the, there's something wrong with your, your generalization bound? There's nothing wrong with the generalization bound. It's still the correct generalization bound. 
this generalization part is just too universal that you want it to be applicable to all kinds of situations. And therefore, by the nature of this design, it cannot be too customized. And therefore, the estimate that you're giving will be universal for all kinds of different learning algorithms for whatever, uh, uh, as long as you say that the, the accuracy and then the confidence level is this number and also the VC dimension is this number, regardless of the distribution, regardless of the learning algorithm, regardless of the hypothesis set, as long as the VC dimension stays the same, uh, you say that they all require 30,000 samples. Uh, that seems to be extremely general and therefore the bar is not extremely tight and we, we should accept, accept this fact. Now, does it mean that the sample complexity is useless? It's still very useful. It tells you what do you express, you expect to see in your, in your problem. So, uh, as a rule of thumb, what do we need, uh, for the number of training samples? Uh, this is not a mathematical calculation. This is just a, a heuristic. As a rule of thumb, 10 times of the VC dimension is often enough. The complication, of course, goes to what is the VC dimension of my deep neural network. That is definitely more difficult to calculate. Okay. However, for more simple, more, a lot simpler calculate, uh, uh, models, like linear models, then you have a very good sense of what is the number of training samples that you require to classify them. Now, I also want to introduce a notion called the error bar. The error bar the, in, in the generalization bound uh, is really the upper bound here that I'm showing you uh, in this equation. So you have this, this, uh, this accuracy, okay, which is uh, we replace the growth function by two to the power n of dc. Uh, so what what is the what can the error bar offer us? Well, the error bar can tell you the following. Suppose you have 100 training samples, and suppose you have uh, confidence level of 0 0.1, and you, you say that the VC dimension is 1. Let me just give you this particular example. Okay. Then you say that, okay, what is the, what is the error bar that it will return me? Well, the error bar, of course, it will be your, your in sample error plus this error. Okay. So this is called the error bar. And this error bar will tell you some information of how accurate is your out sample error compared to your in sample error. So let's plug in all these number into this equation. And then you can show that the out sample error compared to the in sample error, uh, will be, you have a, you have a, uh, you have a, a, a accuracy term, which is also the error bar term. And this term, if you plug the number in, it will be 0.848. Now this number seems to be not very useful. In what sense? Well, if you only have 100 training samples in this case, and then you want to achieve a confidence of 90%. And then you tell me that the model, the hypothesis that you're using, the VC dimension is only one. Now that, that is extremely simple hypothesis set. It could be that it's just too simple. As a result, when you calculate the confidence, you calculate the, the accuracy, the error bar, the error bar is 0.8. And that point X is just an extremely large number. And it says that when you look at the in sample error compared to the out sample error, the out sample error is in sample error plus 0.8. Now we know that the in sample error is a number between zero and one. And so 0.8 would be, it would be just a useless number when you try to say that there is any generalization happening in your learning. Okay. So this is close to useless. Now, what happened? If you use a thousand training samples, if you say that, okay, if I make n equals to 1000, then you can show that the out sample error is upper bounded by the in sample error will be, and then you have a plus 0 0.301. So in this case, you can see that the error becomes a little bit uh, lower. Okay. And so somewhat, a little bit somewhat more respectable uh, estimate. Now, if you want to further improve the error bar, what you should do, well, you can improve, you can increase the VC dimension to a much more, uh, a, a bigger number. And so, um, and so in that case, then you can, uh, uh, make your, uh, 
uh, you can you can you can make your in sample error you can okay so now if you make the VC dimension bigger what will happen is that of course this this confidence that this error bar will grow because it will be a function of of the VC dimension. However, uh, if your VC dimension grows, it actually turns out that your your in sample error this in sample error can be uh, can be better. Now in what sense this in sample error is the training error. The training error, if you have more complicated model, then in principle, your, your in-sample error should go down further because by using a more complex model, you should be able to fit better to your, uh, your in-sample error. Now, the price that you need to pay is that in, the, in, in terms of this error bar, then of course this, this error bar will grow further. The hope is that by reducing your in-sample error, that reduction in sample error will be, will be more than the gain in the error bar, and therefore your, your overall out sample error will be, will be constrained. If you only, if you fix yourself to a particular VC dimension, you don't know, allow yourself to use another more complicated model, then there will be limited things that you can do. The thing would be, it would be just to increase the number of training samples, and as what we are showing you here. Now let's talk about another concept called the model complexity. The model complexity can also be understood from the generalization bound that we have here. Uh, so I'm defining this term as the uh, epsilon. So the epsilon uh, is now a function depending on n, depending on h, and depending on delta. This epsilon is also called the penalty of the model complexity. So what do I mean by that? Well, if the VC dimension is large, uh, then this, this, uh, this epsilon will be large. Okay? And so now if you think in this way, this VC dimension is telling you the complexity of your model. As VC dimension grows, you can see that this error bar will grow as well. As the error bar grows, that means your generalization becomes a little bit more, uh, it will become worse and worse. Okay, assuming that your, your in sample error is fixed. So as VC dimension is large, the epsilon is large, and so that is creating some drawback in terms of generalization. And that is what we call the model complexity. Model complexity refers to the VC dimension, that refers to how complex your model is. So generalization error is large when you use a large uh, epsilon, uh, or, or, or in turns, uh, you're using a large VC dimension. And here we want to introduce a, a trade-off curve as follows. So in this trade-off curve, there are three curves. The first curve is the E in. Okay? So you look at this, this plot, you have the E in, this is the uh, in sample error. As the VC dimension grows, the in sample error should drop. Why? Because you, the more complex model that you use, then of course, and the more uh, ability that you can fit into your training samples. So the, 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 the in sample error will drop as the VC dimension grows. Now, what happens to the model complexity? If you use a model complex, if you use a more and more complex model, okay, as the model complexity grows, okay, uh, in other words, if you use the more and more complex uh, model as the VC dimension grows, then of course the model complexity will grow. Now what is model complexity? Model complexity is the error bar or the epsilon that we are defining here because it scales with respect to the VC dimension. As VC dimension grows, uh, the model complexity will grow. Now why does the shape look like this? The shape looks like this because of the previous slide where you can see that the VC dimension will actually come out from the log and then it will be, it will take, you will take a, a square root on the VC dimension. Uh, and therefore the, the model complexity will scale in this way. So what is the uh, final out sample error? We know that the final out sample error is the sum of your, of your epsilon and also the in sample error. So if you calculate that, then you can see that the sum of the two will give you the, the E out. Now since the, your E in is going down and then your, your model complexity is going up, uh, therefore the sum of the two will go down first and then go up. So this is the behavior of your out sample error, which goes down first to a certain point where you can see that there is an optimum value of VC dimension. This is called the VDC of star. 
Okay, so what is the meaning of this VCC star? This VC dimension says that this is the optimum model complexity that you may want to consider. This is the best model that you, you, should, you should use in order for you to, to, uh, to minimize the outsample error. So that also tells you that if you want to use this VC dimension, you also want to think about what is the number of training samples. Because for different uh, VC dimension, as we have discussed before, from the, from the sample complexity point of view, as you use uh, more and more VC dimensions, the number of training samples that you want to put in should also grow. Uh, therefore, uh, by looking at this curve, we understand that there is a trade-off between the model complexity and also the, also the sample complexity in terms of the out-sample error. Now, I also want to comment on uh, the generalization bound on testing. What all we have discussed before uh, will be the generalization bound for training. This is the, the, the most important thing that we cared about. But suppose that after we have trained the model, now we are entering a phase of testing. We ask, uh, what is the generalization bound for testing? In testing, we mean, really mean that you're looking at the testing data sets where you have data points x1 through xl. The, since the hypothesis is already determined, then there is no need to use the union bound, and therefore you can just apply the very simple Huffington uh, inequality to get the equation. So the Huffington inequality will apply, and it's just as simple as just putting in your final hypothesis into the equation, and then you can evaluate the Huffington inequality. Now, on the right-hand side of this equality, you can see that we have this L here, and this L is the number of uh, testing samples that you can put in. Note that because we have already known what is the final hypothesis, we do not need to run into the game of choosing a hypothesis from the hypothesis set, so you do not need to use the M on the right-hand side of this equation. All you need to do is just to plug in uh, the, the L. The L would be the number of testing samples. There's no more M in this equation. So from this probabilistic equation, you can calculate the generalization bound. The generalization bound says this, uh, you have uh, E out of the G would be upper bound by E in of the G, uh, and then you have the square root of one over two L. That tells you what is the testing error that you should be able to uh, 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 achieve. So if you have a lot of testing errors, then your E in would be a good estimate of your E out. In what sense? Well, as, as your e, e in is here, this is, this is your, your, your in sample error. Okay. So this is what you are doing, uh, do using your testing set. Okay. So now this testing set is, uh, it, you, you should think about it in this way. Uh, there's a population set. You divide it into the training and then you also divide it into the testing. Okay. And normally when you do the testing, you're not testing over all the entire population set. You're only testing using a very small subset of, of the, of the samples. Okay. So think about when you're doing an image classification, you have 1.2 million data points in the image net. You only have maybe a thousand or two thousand samples for, for testing. Okay. So this equation says that, uh, the, the E out would be the testing error using the entire population set. And then the E in here refers to the testing set using only a finite subset of samples. The equation says that as the number of testing samples goes to infinity, then the population would be upper bound by your, by your training and plus the accuracy that you have. And so as L goes to infinity, then the two would be very, very similar. Now this should be very intuitive. Why? Because if you have a lot of testing samples, of course, the, the, the testing error will approach to the actual true population testing error. And that shouldn't be any surprise. Okay, and so this is also independent of the model complexity, because why? Because it doesn't really depend on how to choose the hypothesis, it's just the testing procedure. Uh, that only depends on delta and L. All right, so uh, this is the reading list of this lecture. 
And what we have seen so far would be uh, how do we go from the VC dimension to the generalization bound, and then we have understand the uh, the notion of model complexity and also sample complexity. And from these two, we understand the, the trade-off curve between uh, the, the, the number of samples and also the complexity of the model, and there is an intrinsic trade-off between the two that you cannot use an arbitrarily large uh, model. If you use a very complex model, you also need to scale the number of training samples. So I encourage everyone to take a look at these two, uh, these three uh, references and try to understand the mathematics behind all these uh, principles. And then next time when we come back, we will move on to discuss another perspective of trying to understand the trade-off curves. Now it will be on the uh, bias and variance trade-off.